like I should now start running. Um, hi everybody, hi everybody in the, in the, in the Zoom room and here. Uh, this is uh, the second of our second series of salons um, with the Ostrom Workshop. The theme is Beyond the Web. Um, I wrote a piece about that about a year ago that really talked about the, the architecture of not so much the web, but the, web, the way the web was deployed on a client server basis, which kind of was a slave master basis from the start, um, where we're always like, for example, clicking accept to terms where, why don't they accept our terms? Well, we're always the client, we're never, we're never on, on the server side. And we're basically just looking at ways of looking beyond the frameworks we've had for a long time. And we have a project at the Ostrom Workshop in Bloomington um, called the Byway, um, which uh, is a, a way to test a lot of what we've been talking about in the VRM community, which is in this room for the last 17 years. Um, and rather than trying to boil the ocean, we want to kind of hit heat a cup and see if that works to sort of prove out some of our ideas. But I won't go any further into that. We have today um, Roger McNamee. Roger's an outstanding musician. He's a VC. He's um, uh, a man of many trades, and he's been an advisor to many entrepreneurs over the years, most famously um, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, about whom he wrote the book Zucked several years ago, which is a bestseller. Um, and we're at a, a kind of propitious moment right now. There's a sense of, we talked about this a bit this morning, um, there's a sense of opportunity that's happening right now because of, of the end of the, the election and many other things going on at once. But I'm going to hand the floor over to Roger and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. And hello to everybody who's back in Indiana. So I spent my entire professional career investing in Silicon Valley. I was very much a booster of all the work we do here. And it was only in the past decade that I came to realize that the Silicon Valley that I joined in 1982 was a distant memory, that the culture had changed really dramatically. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to engage in a thought experiment. And so I'm asking you all to suspend disbelief for the next 30 minutes or so while I take you on the intellectual journey that I've gone on. And some of the things I'm going to suggest to you will sound, well, very different from what you're used to. And I'm just asking you to humor me. I'm not going to try to convince you of anything so much as to take you to a place you may not have been and give you an opportunity to ask yourself what you would do differently if you believe the things I was saying were true. I'm not asking you to believe them, just engage in the thought experiment with me. So I came to Silicon Valley answering the call of Steve Jobs, right? <laughs> I mean, I came to a Silicon Valley that was formed in 1956 by the IBM antitrust case, where the consent decree required uniquely in the whole world, a separation of computers from telecommunications, creating a computer industry. It also took the intellectual property of AT&T and put it in the public domain, most famously the transistor, which literally created Silicon Valley. So I want to put a small pin in the notion that the industry we're all involved in exists because of government regulation. <laughs> and it turns out that every subsector that matters since then was also created by an antitrust intervention. IBM case in the mid 60s creates software and leads to the personal computer. Carter phone creates data networking. The AT&T case in the 80s takes cellular telephony, accelerates it by a, or by a decade and creates the internet. The Microsoft case creates internet platforms as we know them today. Just place that someplace useful in case you want to go back to it. So the culture I came with to, to join was an amalgam of the gung-ho spirit of the space program, which when I arrived as an analyst in 1982, the space shuttle was the biggest thing going on in the valley. 
And, you know, that sort of gung-ho optimism, that idealism that, you know, the Apollo 13 guys in their short sleeve white shirts with the ties, the plastic pocket protectors. And of course, the hippies as embodied by Atari and Apple, who had a more utopian idealism. But the two of them meshed really well. And the notion was we were explicitly going to use technology to empower people. It was a really, again, utopian, but very positive and constructive thing. And it was aided and abetted by a simple fact. There was never enough technology resource to do what you wanted to do. You were either constrained by processing power, memory, storage, or bandwidth, or more likely all four, okay? And so as a consequence, if you were an engineer, your job, and for the folks who are in Bloomington, most of the people in the room with me here are roughly my age. So they actually lived this experience. <laughs> so, so you are constrained by whatever your customer is willing to pay for today, right? You couldn't really sit there and think about making a global product. It wasn't technically possible. You basically sat there and the guy goes, you know, I'd really like to switch this button from here to there. And that became your entire focus. <laughs> and the reality was that the stuff that people produced was brilliant because it took real genius to make things that actually worked when you were so constrained. I mean, we think about going to the moon with the tiny amounts of processing power and storage that they had. And we think about the early video games and how just completely genius they were. And then around 2003, 2004, all that changes, right? We're coming out of the dot-com bubble bursting. Venture capitalists have all run for the hills. But it turns out the predecessors to Amazon Web Services have... So guys, we're engaged in a thought experiment. So just humor me while we're talking here and imagine what I'm saying here. Please take a seat. Imagine what I'm saying here for the purpose of this conversation might actually be worth thinking. <laughs> so 2003, 2004, all of a sudden, Moore's Law catches up. Right? And we also we get all the processing power we need. We got all the memory we need. We got all the storage we need. And if you're on a wired network, we had all the bandwidth we need to do real time video. By 2010, we can do it on a cell phone. There are literally no constraints. I would like to hypothesize, and I do this with the benefit of having actually seen it happen that this caused a radical transformation in the culture of Silicon Valley. Because suddenly you no longer needed to listen to anybody, much less customers. You could impose your will on anybody. And the reality was the presence of things like Amazon Web Services totally transformed the economics of startups. You may have forgotten this, but if you wanted to create a pets.com competitor in 1998 or 1999, you had to build your own stack. It was like 125 million bucks just to turn the damn thing on. Right? That was really high risk. The person who ran your technology stack was not a 20 year old. You didn't write $125 million checks to 20 year olds. That person was in their 40s and had done it before. Right? Culturally speaking, this is people with children, with families who, you know, had a sense of social connection. But when you can do it with a credit card, the cost collapses. It goes to 10 million bucks from 125, which if you're a venture capitalist means the risk has collapsed by more than an order of magnitude, which means you don't need a 45 year old entrepreneur anymore. You can do this with a kid from Harvard whose employees all lived in his dorm. Let's think about what that does culturally, okay? Now let's also think through that the first people who understood the significance of this, who understood that the World Wide Web was moving from a web of pages to a web of people, were the PayPal Mafia. Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Reid Hoffman. They had shall we say, an idiosyncratic value system. <laughs> they certainly did not subscribe 
to the values of Steve Jobs that had drawn me and maybe many of you to Silicon. They believed that some people were better than others, that certain genders were better than others, that certain races were better than others. They believed that certain people were entitled to do what they wanted and that the consequences, if any, should be absorbed by those affected rather than those causing the problem. I cannot overstate how different culturally that was from the world I'd come into, which is not to say that all the people from my era were good people. No, I, mean, I was a pretty broad brushed investor. I came across all kinds. But the difference was that these guys were responsible for the founding of LinkedIn and Facebook. And they became the icon a new era. And at the beginning, the artifacts of the value system of the old persisted for a while. But thanks to Google's invention of surveillance capitalism, and thanks to the widespread understanding of behavioral economics, you had tools to monetize sociopathy. <laughs> And between 2007 and 2012, we saw a transformation in the startup world from viewing sociopathy as a bug to viewing it as a feature. And in 2010, well, 2009 uh, or 2008, I forget which year it was, Mark Zuckerberg gave us a chance to invest in Spotify when it first started. And my business partner was a rock star. And so I was looking at this with a very special lens. And we look at the first contract, which is Sony is 45 million bucks. 3 million of it goes to the artist. 42 of it goes to Sony is R&D. And I'm gone, dude, we cannot do this. This is exploiting your community, right? The next year it's Uber and Lyft and Airbnb. Her basic rule is the law does not apply to us. We can do whatever we want. We're entitled. I look at my partner and I go, guys, I don't do this. And the problem was I realized that the best and brightest of Silicon Valley were all embraced in predatory business models. And I make a choice, right? I can't run a fund where I'm not going to invest in the best of Silicon Valley. So I'm faced with a choice. I either have to abandon my principles or I got to retire. So I told my partners I was retiring. So let's fast forward and think through what's happened. As a country in 1980, we embraced a value system for the economy that was 180 degrees from the one that the country was founded. So you think 1774, 75, I forget which year it is, Boston Tea Party. What is it? It's a rebellion against monopoly. The, the United States in its earliest days associated monopoly with monarchy and authoritarianism. It said you cannot have concentrated economic power and democracy at the same time. That was our founding, literally our founding principle. That works perfectly well till the Industrial Revolution gets really rocking, right? And, you know, because we're agrarian when we start out, so we don't really, well, what do we know from that? And in 1890, we realized that concentrated economic power is having some really disturbing impacts on democracy. And so we passed the Sherman Act. It takes us to 1914 before we put even baby teeth into the Sherman Act, and 1938 before we actually give it real claws. That's 48 years, but by the end of 48 years, we have really succeeded in reimposing the value system of the United States on the economy. So the way to think about it is we ran an experiment with unbridled capitalism from 1870 to 1933. And it produced tremendous growth, but enormous economic inequality, and it really undermined democracy. We have a depression, because capitalism hits a wall. Roosevelt comes to the rescue, saves capitalism with the New Deal, 
we reset, we have a much fairer system for a while based on collective action rather than a small number of individuals choosing it. Very high tax rates, but a ton of public goods, education, healthcare, transportation, all these great systems. Johnson and then Nixon between the Vietnam War and Great Society put the system in economic peril, then the oil shock hits and blows it up completely. And the country goes, eh, we're gonna try something different. We bring in Reagan and we go back to unbridled capitalism. 40 years, we have let markets allocate resources in all circumstances. We have attributed to billionaires wisdom in all domains, mm -hmm. and therefore trusted them to make all the important decisions in our economy and in our society. And we have looked at the tech industry as though it is a linear process with one predetermined course that cannot be altered and can only be led by the people who are leading it now. If we'd applied that notion in 1956, Silicon Valley would be called American Telephone Telegraph. And we probably still wouldn't have cell phones. So I look at it and I go, we're in a really, really bad place. We have a community run by sociopaths who for whatever reason we trust. Now, what's happened the past two weeks? <laughs> uh, let me think. So Musk takes over Twitter and he fires first half the employees and then 80% of the contractors, which is more than two thirds of his total headcount. He changes course about six times. He pisses off literally everybody he needs to survive. And the site is already after two weeks showing serious signs of operational distress. Facebook's announced it's gonna lay off 13% of its workforce, 11,000 people. Amazon says it's gonna lay off 10,000 people. FTX vaporizes. <laughs> and the venture capital industry goes, oh, they're just bad people. This doesn't apply to the rest of our portfolio. <laughs> I, I, we've seen that movie before. So I think we're in a really, really, really special moment. Because a few things are like really obviously true. And we're all pretending like they aren't obviously true. So for at least a decade, everything in our economy, not just the Silicon Valley, but literally everywhere, has been based on the assumption that interest rates would be approximately zero, inflation would be approximately zero, and that global peace would prevail, allowing for arbitrarily long supply chains so you could optimize labor cost all the time. Now, let's assess those three assumptions. <laughs> Where would you say they are today? I would say that they're not just invalid today, that we've moved to a different era, that we are early in a multi-generational reframing of the global economy and geopolitics. So just as in 1933, we abandoned unbridled capitalism in favor of collective action to fight the depression, just as in 1981, we abandoned the New Deal to re-embrace re uh, unfettered capitalism, we are at a moment of decision. Now, I think our political leadership is conspicuously not plugged into this, right? Very Hoover-esque, I would say, okay? And I would observe that when I speak to groups, and this is very true when I speak to college groups, people sit there and go, well, the government can't fix these problems. And I'm going, really? If you say that ahead of time, it becomes self-fulfilling. But what we're supposed to remember is the government is us. And, you know, if you're a young person today, 
you're being groomed to be a drone in a very large economic system, right? You go to school, you take out a huge amount of student loans, you come into a job market where opportunity is very limited, or entrepreneurship is almost impossible because the biggest industries in the economy are dominated by monopolists. And you're set up for a life of indentured servitude. I would point out that people under the age of 30 are the largest voting bank in America. And you flexed a little bit of muscle in 22, a little bit of muscle in 20, and had a really big impact. If you voted at the 70% rate, you'd literally change everything in our politics and everything in our economy. I'm encouraging guys to think about that because I think that's a big opportunity. The other thing I'd point out to you is that if we recognize where we are, which is that the global economy has completely changed, we might sit there and go, gosh, are there any levers we could push that would make a difference? There's one really obvious one, which is that all of our geopolitical problems are the result of oil. Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, take your pick. If I were in charge, my first rule would be, I wouldn't make the value of oil zero. I don't need to do it tomorrow. I just need to announce the intention that that's the goal. And then we move the entire damn economy off of oil for two reasons. One, I'd like to save the environment so we can still breathe, or at least so our children can breathe. But secondly, that's the biggest economic opportunity since the early industrial revolution. Can you imagine how much economic value you're gonna create? How much innovation you require? How many incredible startups are gonna come out of sitting there and going, okay, we're going off of oil completely. In fact, we're probably gonna go off of individual vehicles, right? We're probably gonna to have to think about collective action again, right? Which means public transportation, but what happens if you do that? Have you ever looked at a map of LA and seen how much of LA is parking lots? Do you know what that real estate is worth if it stops being parking lots? Imagine Highway 80. You wanna have self-driving trucks? You wanna have high-speed rail across the country? Let's take Highway 80. We'll take one direction and make it self-driving trucks in two directions so you can ship things. And the other one, we're gonna make high-speed rail. Right? You'd be done in no time flat, and you solve two problems at the same time, right? You discourage people from driving cars, and you create really, really, really good alternatives. Again, it's a thought experiment. I'm not asking you to believe any of this, okay? I'm really pointing out to you, the future isn't as grim as it looks, okay? I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff going on now, but the solution to it is actually really exciting. So when I think about the internet, when I think about the World Wide Web, we talk about beyond the web. The first thing to understand is today's web is a core part of every problem we have. To, I mean, if you vaporized it completely, we would be demonstrably better off. Yes, a lot of things would be inconvenient for a while, but think about how much easier it would be to solve the really big problems in society if you didn't have a tool that was optimized for preventing you from doing anything that breaks the status quo. How much easier would it be to solve climate change, to solve gun violence? to create a sense of community. If you didn't have a tool that was literally optimized to prevent all those things from happening. I've spent six years trying to persuade elected officials to regulate the World Wide Web for three, in three different ways. First, well, really for all of tech to require as a condition of market access, the demonstration of safety. Technology products are almost without exception today, unsafe. And I mean, you look at the web, that's really obvious, but self-driving cars, it's insane. I mean, we know how to do self-driving vehicles. You put them in their own lane and you put a beacon on anything they can run into. That's not what we're doing. 
we're going to go out there and run over tens of thousands of pedestrians before we figure it out. Right? Because self driving cars are the Theranos of transportation. <laughs> right? There's nothing about Theranos that won't eventually happen. You will eventually be able to do a blood test from a drop of blood. But there's a lot of more lost steps in between, and the same thing is true with self driving cars. Doesn't mean we don't do it, just means you gotta be honest about it. Crypto, I mean, I think we can today safely conclude it's dangerous. <laughs> How about facial recognition? How about artificial intelligence? Because artificial intelligence, when married to behavioral economics, is purely harmful. No social good at all. And that is the primary economic use case of artificial intelligence today. Doesn't mean AI can't be valuable. All of these things can be valuable, but there are currently no incentives to be valuable because there's no rule that says you have to protect people. You don't have to look out for the public good. And I'm kind of going, eh, I'd like to stop that. Second thing, I'd like to get away from business models that exploit human weakness, right? That's what surveillance capitalism is. It's not just internet platforms, right? Every company in the economy is embracing because they all want little of that Facebook, Google mojo. Right, so you get a car today, right? It's connected to your phone, right? To get in the door and all that other stuff. And then you're an hour late with your lease payment and the car won't stop. Or you go a little bit too fast or you will run a stop sign or something. And your insurance runs go up. You know, these things are not serving your interests at all. None. So we need to have rules about that. I, again, I'm at the point where my belief is you just blow the whole thing up. You, I mean, as you sit there, and I totally agree with Google. I think the details matter, so fuck the details. Let's just drop a nuke in, blow the whole thing up, and start over again. But this time with the rules. You know? Because, I mean, if you sit and look at how today, all these entrepreneurs sit there and tell you, but it's more economically efficient to do it our way. And I go, I'll grant you that. I just don't value economic efficiency as much as I value democracy and the right to self-determination. I value those things more highly. I'm cool with an economic inefficiency when it allows me to make my own choices or to have my, you know, a politics that's based on all of us having a value and all of us being respected and all of us having a voice. I mean, democracy is inherently inefficient because it requires deliberation. Same thing with self-determination. I'm cool with that. And again, that's not a good or bad thing. I don't think these people are evil, but they have a different value system, which I disagree with. And as a country, we've failed to have a public debate about that. And I think that's too bad. You know, because we got, but Elon Musk, he's giving us a chance to have it now. Right? Because you look at what he's doing and you go, I mean, anybody who thinks that billionaires are per se wiser and smarter than the rest of us, <laughs> pardon my French, especially in Indiana, you gotta be fucking kidding me. I mean, look up Dunning Kruger effect, okay? Seriously. I mean, if I write a movie about this, one guy's gonna be named Dunning and the other guy's gonna be named <laughs> It's, I mean, it's been obvious to me for more than a decade that all, you know, the, the secret of great entrepreneurship is that you've got to be extraordinarily focused in a narrow area and extraordinarily capable and completely resilient. The problem is if you start doing that in your teenage years, you go public in your early 20s, by the time you're in your 30s, you don't know squat about anything else, right. right? I mean, not anything else. And yet we sit there and assume wisdom and brilliance in all domains. And we have no safety net. What if they're wrong? I mean, I have enormous admiration for the people who run Silicon Valley, but I would not let them babysit children, <laughs> right? I mean, that's not what they're good at, okay? It's not what they're good at. Asking people to do what they're not good at has historically been a bad strategy. <laughs> so I would like us 
to imagine a world in which we have agency, in which the future is a result of conscious choices we make, as opposed to passive acceptance of the status quo. I want you to understand, I do not expect to prevail in this conversation. <laughs> I've spent six years at it, face to face with all of our elected officials from bottom to top. And the power of the status quo is huge, but we got them outnumbered. And if young people would recognize that they have agency, that nobody's gonna say, right? That this is a choice of, if you want a future, you gotta be the future you wanna see. And, you know, so I don't know where we're gonna go. Uh, I would like to think that the combination of what happened on election day and the insanity that's going on in Silicon Valley right now will cause us all to pause and start that conversation. Anyway, thank you all very much and happy to take any questions you may have. If you have. Done. All right. So, in the time that I've been in this area, it seems like the internet has beaten the dystopia threat several times. It's beaten key escrow dystopia. It's beaten software patent cartel dystopia. It's beaten DRM mandate dystopia. So. We've had a kind of building up of an organization of, of a, an internet freedom loving set of organizations. Today, we're kind of on, on the fourth level of the dystopia game, which is the surveillance capitalism dystopia. <laughs> and this time, all the meetings are open to the public, whether it's IAB or the CMA in the UK, or um, the Worldwide Web Consortium, all kinds of opportunities are available for people to come in and, and watch the dystopia being built in real time, whether it's on Zoom or GitHub. But we're not seeing that same activist energy that we got with the dystopias the last time. Okay. What's, what's going wrong? So, so I, I... I'd like to break that into two parts. I'd like to challenge your perception of the past dystopias. I would characterize them all as dystopias of low level architecture things where it was really about displacing past power structures. So DRM is to me the most significant one because I think DRM was flawed in many, many ways, but the notion that that the people who create art, whether it's music or books or whatever, should be entitled to some benefit from that, strikes me as a very reasonable argument that the internet essentially asserted the alternative and prevailed. So I, I would argue that, that if you are a creative person, the internet itself is an extreme dystopia. And as a professional musician, I can tell you that the internet has given some positives from a promotional point of view, but it has taken the value of what people like me create and devalued it by more than 99%. Okay. So my first point to you is it, where you sit has a huge impact on how you perceive the past dystopias. Um, and, you know, I think there are many communities, even in technology, who would share that because this has been very much a white man's model imposed on literally everyone else. When I look at where we are today, I think we're dealing with something that is different both in scale and in, and in kind from those past ones. Because we have watched for the past, at a minimum six years, and I would argue it started before that, um, that the goals of the people running the internet of the established people were in conflict with the rights and goals of literally everyone else 
And so, you know, it, if you look at it, if your focus is on maximizing economic efficiency in all instances, and I would argue that's really been Google's core value from the beginning. And again, I don't think it's a good or bad thing. I think it's simply a value system. The problem is that they view democracy as inefficient and therefore a target of opportunity. They view personal choice and human autonomy as inefficient, therefore a target of opportunity. So Google, when they create a map product, doesn't create a map product to help you get from A to B faster. They create it in order to load balance an entire network where some days it's your turn to be the one given a shitty route to work because that's what balances the load. And my point is Silicon Valley is playing God. I happen to be against the notion of anyone playing God. I would, I'm, I, well, I was raised in a family that was committed to the civil rights movement in the 60s. And I believe that we were finally embarking in a, a, a long period of respecting everybody and expanding rights for everybody. And that once you started the process, it would be irreversible. But internet platforms have enabled the reversal of almost everything I cared about. They didn't cause it, but they have made it much easier and accelerated the rate. And they are clearly aligned. Watch what happens with Musk over the next two weeks as elements of his ad business break down. And as he starts to realize he owes a billion and a half a year in debt service and he's only got whatever, three or four hundred million of cash flow. OK, who's he going to line up with? You think he's going to line up with people like me? I don't think so. I think he's going to line up with the people who love him unconditionally. Those people are not my people. He's entitled to do what he wants, but we're entitled as a group to say, you know what? We've had enough of you. Yes, sir. Um, so I have lived on a new scale, the same arc of technology awareness as you described. And the place where I am now, and you are right now in front of students at the uh, university, is I cannot face the fact that I cannot give these students advice as to how to go out and make a living in this world that we are both very much now come to understand. So I, for instance, even though I'm senior enough to know all the people in power, uh, in, in my circle of medicine, uh, I'm not even allowed one lecture at Harvard Medical School in the last five years to talk about this perception of technology as it relates to professional licensing, professions, et cetera. And so what's your solution? Yes, we all, I agree with you. They are, the power is there, but the educational system that we are in, never mind the internet, does not support a transition to <laughs> There's no question about that. Um, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. When I was 12 years old in 1968, I went to work for Gene McCarthy every single day for three months because I did the math and I realized when I was 18, if Nixon got elected, when I was 18, I would get drafted and sent to Vietnam. So at age 12, I went to work full time to try to end the Vietnam. <laughs> there, is, there is a woman named Olivia Julian in Texas who is, to me, my greatest inspiration. You know, for her, there was David Hogg, but Olivia is, she's just at another level. And if you don't know her, look her up. She's the one that Matt Gates made fun of and she raised two million bucks for reproductive freedom on the back of one insult from Matt Gates. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that, okay? And if I'm, I think the reality is we don't get to choose the times we live in. If you think about the children who are coming out of school in Europe in the 30s, they didn't get to choose the environment they were in. Nobody guarantees you a smooth transition from childhood to adult life. There are times when we have to stand up for the things we believe in and fight for the goals we want to have. And sometimes that means we don't get the things we want or the things we were promised. I fear we're at one of those moments. 
And I think we have two choices. We can either attack it now before it's fully set, or we can wait for it to be fully set, wait a while, mass things and come back. I look at the people of Ukraine and I go, wow. I mean, tell me what was different about the about people in Ukraine two years ago relative to people in Silicon Valley. Right? There was no difference. The difference is they got attacked and they instantaneously shifted to a different mindset. I would like to suggest that that's our worst case option. That's what happens if we just go along with this. Eventually, we're going to have to do that. Because these guys aren't going to quit. And they're winning, right? And we're letting them. And the question is, are we always going to let them? We have two, uh, two questions online. Oh, good. That's so, good. Yeah. So, Angie, do you want to read them? Of course. Well, first, let me thank you for that wonderful overview. And now someone has just typed something else in. So let me. Um, so I think this falls right along with what you were just saying. So Mark asks, how do we realign incentives to plot a path forward a third attractor and get off our path of least resistance race to the bottom where we sacrifice exactly what you're just talking about privacy? Hey, that, let, let, let me take that head on. So I think the fundamental problem is that for 40 years, there's been a community in the United States who have argued that we have no common interests, that everyone is the Marlboro Man, right? You're on your own. And since 1981, that has been our creed. It doesn't, by the way, both political parties have subscribed to this. The perception was there was no alternative but to go along with markets being in charge of everything, and each one of us being an independent actor. We've completely forgotten our shared interests. We've lost trust. We've lost a sense of community. And what happens is that some communities get directly attacked and suddenly have a reason to throw away the nonsense of the Marlboro Man image and replace it with something else. So, there is a movement to reform journalism. I would make an observation about journalism. I think journalism is broken beyond repair today. When I was a kid, there were five power centers in America, big government, big business, big labor, big religion, and journalism. You could never get more than two of them on the same side because big religion was not political. And journalism perceived that its job was to stand up to power. The Republicans very cleverly got big religion to be political and aligned with them. Reagan got rid of unions, so big labor went away. And big journalism, because it got very consolidated, decided to go along with the status quo. So there's no opposing power in our system, none at all. I think that the way you restore that is you give people a sense of community, which means I don't actually want news anymore. I just want facts. I want to create a Wikipedia for local community information so that every school board, every court, every town council, all those things get publicly reported into a thing of viewable by anybody. Why does it matter? Because this is where the Washington Post is right, right? Democracy dies in darkness. I mean, you know, so the topic for another day, but it's all about creating a sense of community, a sense of belonging. That is not a thing that we can do at the national level. And all these clowns are trying to reform journalism are focused on the national stuff. And I'm going, that's the problem, right? We might be better off without a lot of those things. What we really need is to find out what our neighbors have in common with us? What are the things that we care about? And that's why this attempt to take over school boards is potentially such a catalyzing political force in our communities, because we have to sit there and ask the question, do we want, literally, people want to burn books in charge of our school boards? In fact, that then gets you to the whole topic of, what the hell happened to public education? When I was a kid, public education was a really big deal. It was one of America's competitive advantages. Not anymore. Maybe we should reinvest in our schools. 
You know, maybe we should get away from tests and away from STEM and back to things that teach critical thinking skills, and teach people to be citizens. Right? Those are all very positive things. And so my point to you for the kids, you don't get to control the times you live in. And it's really important to recognize what your advantages are and what your deficiencies are. And if you have deficiencies, you find a lot of people you can align with to make you stronger. So let's take another question in the room and then back so to online. This guy right here. Okay. Yes. Um, so, so going forward is at what level the change is first going to take place? And a lot of what you said earlier, it seemed to be implied on a, on a national US level. There's an international level, uh, international level, there is a more local level, and in technology specifically. Um, where does this stuff begin to get hold? It's my personal belief that what we essentially have to do is find like-minded individuals with similar value system and grow sort of quote unquote parallel societies where at least on the technology side, we have to combine not just the technology but the governments and the business model into something that is has some kind of participatory um, model that governs all parts of it and not just you know certain, certain aspects of it because they have always done cyber. So it may be that we disagree about this, but I believe the technology has almost no role in solving this problem. The technology is something we're going to put on afterwards. The core problem is human. It's each of us looking each other in the eye, okay, and saying, what are our values? What do we care about? If we're always going to be tribal, it's going to be super hard to fix anything. If we view people who disagree with us as the enemy, it's impossible to fix anything. And the problem with technology is that technology is not social, right? Transberg's right. It's neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. It reflects the values of the people who created who are mostly white, mostly male, mostly extremely privileged. We have to fix the problems in society before technology can be helpful because technology has to, it has to start to reflect all of us not just white men coming from privileged backgrounds. Okay, let's go and ask a student. Okay, uh, Angie, got another question? We have a question in the room. Hi, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm currently a doctoral student um, studying Section 230 at the law school. Um, I feel very empowered by your speech. I have a, a quick question here, which is um, you talk about the issue, uh, the problem of business model. So what is the alternative business model that you see currently exists that you would actually recommend? And how would the internet look like um, if we employed an alternative uh, business model um, in, your, in your view? Thank you. Great question. So this will disappoint you, but I think that 230 is not core to the question or the solution, okay? I think that 230 is important because it enables Wikipedia. The interpretation of 230 in the courts has been irresponsible from the jump, you know, starting with Grindr. The reality is once you make a business choice to use algorithms to promote content that grabs attention, those are editorial choices and should be outside the protection of section 230. And we have not chosen to interpret it that way. And I think that's done in enormous harm. And so here's the core point that I would make. I would like, if I were in charge of economic policy in the United States, the first thing I would do, I would ban stock repurchases by public companies. The second thing I would do is I would ban all mergers and acquisitions above, I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 million in revenue. Ban them entirely. I want, I want the market to actually work. I want to drive bad companies out of business instead of having them being taken over. I would basically, in the data economy, I would ban all third-party data applications until further notice. Okay. 
I can give you data for a service, but you then have to vaporize it. You can't build a model, you can't store it, you can't share it, you can't use it. Drives Don nuts, but uh, this is a stake in the ground, so we can have a debate. Um, I would like to see a world where it's impossible to become a billionaire. I believe the existence of billionaires is a policy failure. And the tax rates on corporations need to be much higher in order to force them to invest in their businesses. I think the tax rates on rich people need to be literally, you know, five times higher than they are now. And that there should be confiscatory taxes on extreme wealth because it's a, it's a mistake. And you sit there while well, you're taking the incentive away and I'm going, yep, that's exactly what I'm doing. Because I think the incentives are broken. And the point is, I'm not gonna win this argument. I don't expect to win this argument. I am putting a post down so that the conversation can happen in a space where solutions exist. I expect to compromise aggressively. I am actually a capitalist, but I do believe that companies that have 40% pre-tax margins represent a failure, right? You can only do that by taking advantage of somebody who has less power than you. And I think the days of using technology to exploit human weakness have to end. And, you know, in Congress, working in Congress for six years, and I can tell you, there are no bills to require safety. I can't even get anybody to take it seriously, which is insane since that has been the primary regulatory function of the US government since 1870 with the creation of building codes. Right, 1893 Railroad Safety Appliance Act requires couplers and air brakes to end the tens of thousands of deaths on railroads. 1906, Pure Food and Drug Act. 1938, the Fair Labor Practices Act and the amendments to the Pure Food and Drug Act that put real teeth in it, the environmental laws of the 60s. Safety is a big government thing, but there's no, no, and almost all the bills in Congress to do reform of the business model are aimed at symptoms rather than systemic issues. I'm all in favor of focusing on children, but if you're gonna focus on children, focus on the root causes of the problem, because if you sell them for kids, you sell them for everybody. Because there's, you know, the business model is the problem. You can't have billionaires and a society at the same time. I mean, that's my hypothesis. Prove me wrong. I can't prove you wrong, but I've been nodding my head the whole time. Um, thank you very much, Roger. Chris, you've been quite a while since I've seen you. Um, gosh, I am so into everything you're talking about. I've been working on this stuff for a long time as well. Over the last year or so, I've been exploring the ideas of zero profit companies. At least that's my name for it, and getting into co-ops more as the actual model to allow for this. And when I looked at that, I realized that the legal models we have, LLCs, corporations, etc., are not unique to creating exploitative profits. They're actually designed to have governance and control that we share appropriately. But it's the mindset that we have coming into it. If I may, one other point before you get in. Where I came to realize this is when I started my first company, um, I didn't know how to do equity. I was 24 years old. The internet 1994 whatever that is and uh one guy came in and like the first month i'm like you get 14 percent some other guy came in six weeks later oh i only got seven percent left for you so i had no real consciousness in the value contribution for which i was exchanging future income and equity so i felt like that was what you said original sin before that's my original sin thinking i deserve all of this when i didn't feel it okay so and so yeah I, so I, I am actually not against profit. I'm not okay? either. I'm and I think that the system that we had until 2004 worked surprisingly well. Hmm. You know, I mean, Gates became a billionaire, right? Gordon Moore and Andy Grove became billionaires, but very few people did. And The basic model was, you know, a company would get 20% pre-tax profit margin. That was up the stack. And most people were fighting for 10 or so percent. And that those were good numbers. And that, you know, when I went to Wall Street, you know, becoming an analyst, which was what I was, that was, that was an academic job. You know, it paid a salary. Nobody ever got rich doing what I did. 
And I would argue that it was a policy failure that people in my line of work had an opportunity to be really economically successful. I mean, I want to be economically successful, but so disproportionately economically successful to have things be so out of balance. You know, the people who do the work, I mean, somebody said to me the other day, they really believe in Web3 because they, they're going, you know, FTX is an outlier. It doesn't apply to my company. They did this thing with musical artists and they gave 30%, 38% of the coins to the artists. I'm going, wait a minute, the artist is creating 100% of the value. How did you arrive at 38? <laughs> and how did you arrive at thinking that that was heroic on your part? <laughs> right? Because he did. He thought that was heroic. My point is maybe it is heroic. I mean, record labels are awful, you know, so we shouldn't pretend that the old way is good. But I'm, I'm kind of an idealist. I'd like to think we can do better. And again, for the kids in, 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 in Bloomington, I do not expect to win any of these arguments. This is a thought experiment. I'm just trying to get you to imagine what the world would look like if what I was saying was true. And the reality is in your lifetime, some of it may come true, not likely in mine, but that's okay, you know? Um, so I'm not actually doing this because this is helping me, <laughs> right? I mean, being an activist turns out to be incredibly costly, you know? Um, but it's okay. Life's been good. I've been given a lot of gifts. This is how I choose to spend it. Are there other questions? So just to be clear, if I, I definitely believe in, in capitalism and human capitalism, but I'm thinking about reasonable profits versus exploitation. No, no, I think I, so. I think the notion that that the, the, you know, what, if reasons. we look if we look at what's going on with the oil companies right now, with the outrageous profits that they're getting, that does seem like an, an opportunity <clears throat> for a policy adjustment, right? You know, unfettered capitalism turns out to be very bad for democracy, it turns out to be very good, very bad for many aspects of civil rights and public interest. And, you know, the sooner we acknowledge that, the easier it will be to fix the problem. So without war or uh, famine or something else, uh, how are we going to end up planting the seed to switch from the rugged individualism of Teddy and the Marble Man to collective action. My hypothesis was I was going to go around and talk about it. Yeah. Well, and, and my addition to that, because that's pretty are. much the limit of my yeah. skill set. Yeah. Okay. And now the truth is, I've been at it for six years, and everything's gotten a lot worse. So it's not at all obvious that me talking about it is helping. Okay. I'm I, I'm looking at Olivia Giuliani and thinking I like her way way better than mine. Okay. I think she's really 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 good. And the reality is that George Floyd involuntarily was a staggeringly important voice on this stuff, you know, and um, I, there's a woman in Congress named Lucy McBath, right, whose son was killed by gun violence, who's managed to get herself reelected twice. I mean, she's unbelievable. There's a woman in Kansas named Sharice Davids, Native American. Really profoundly cool. There's another woman in Illinois uh, who is a nurse. I'm Congress. You know, we're seeing different voices get represented. Ayanna Presley in Massachusetts, super cool. You know, Deb Holland, who got elected in Mexico, and is now the Secretary of the Interior, right? And you know, I think that's where it starts. This kid in Florida, 25 years old, loving that, right? AOC, oh my God, political force of nature. I just worry about her safety. I really worry about her safety because they're nuts out there and they're not doing anything about it. They're sitting there saying, well, I'm too busy. And maybe you are too busy, but if we don't find a way to become less busy, Bad things are going to happen. I mean, bad things are already happening. What am I talking about? Bad things are already happening. It's the future. <laughs> yeah. We can we can keep going on in a minute. We're going to cut the recording. So, 
Can we thank you very much? For we can do whatever you like. It's free. <laughs> I believe it's a free country. Or I'd like to say that. <laughs> Speaking to the student issue, you know, I think you were mentioning the agency and seeking for better, better than what they're seeing and experiencing. And I just wanted to say uh, amen to that. And I think one of the huge challenges on um, Tim Wu, I believe, wrote an article called The Tyranny of Convenience. Yeah. And, you know, these, this particular community doesn't know agency like we had known it. They don't yeah. know the, the sunlight of it, the fresh air of it, the empowerment of it. And that clarity, I think, is blocked by the tyranny of convenience. And I would encourage anybody who's trying to elevate themselves above that space is to understand the complexities of convenience in the human operating system and to try and find, uh, you know, analogs and stories of how good it felt. You know, when the, like if you said, if you cook the internet today, um, it wouldn't take long, we'd be a lot better for it, you know? So one of the things, I am not a parent, so I've not had the experience of dealing 